Live from KZ12, the night beat starts right now. We begin tonight with a look at the latest COVID-19 numbers here in Bear County. Five new deaths today, raising our death toll to 122. The county also surpassing 14,500 cases with an additional 341 new cases today. Hospital numbers looking no better tonight. Right now there are 1,120 patients in local hospitals, 351 in the ICU, 191 on ventilators. According to the city's website, only 15 15% of all beds are available at this time. These numbers coming as the state sets another new record. Across Texas, 8,258 people have tested positive just today, pushing the statewide total just shy of 200,000 total cases. There are also close to 8,000 people hospitalized statewide. And just a reminder, this holiday weekend, Governor Greg Abbott has mandated face masks for counties with 20 or more positive cases. Breaking that order could set you back. $250. Tonight, Atascosa County is mourning the loss of their emergency management coordinator, David Prasivka, who has been leading the county through its coronavirus response, lost his own personal battle with COVID-19. County officials say in addition to the disease, Prasivka had also recently been diagnosed with an underlying health condition which severely compromised his immune system. In addition to his role with the county, Prasivka was also a fi volunteer firefighter in Jordanton. A holiday weekend turns into a nightmare at Canyon Lake as first responders search for a missing person they believe may have drowned. Yeah, Comal County officials say a 25 year old man was last seen entering the water at Canyon Lake, but he never resurfaced. The night team Stephen Cavazos now with the search efforts that have been underway most of the evening. A rescue search that lasted several hours ends with no answers. Multiple first responders searched an area off of Canyon Lake known as Party Cove. That's where they say a 25 year old man was last seen. The Canyon Lake Fire Department, Comal County Sheriff's Office, Texas Game Warden all responded. But because of the holiday weekend, the search is expected to continue tomorrow. It's unsafe to splash divers at this point, so we're going to wait until boat traffic is diminished tomorrow morning. Comal County officials say the man was on a boat before he went into the water but never came back up. A dive team has been requested for tomorrow's search. However, first responders are urging people to use precaution before going into the water. Watch out for yourselves. Watch out for your friends. Watch out for your children. Encourage everyone to wear a life jacket. Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Military City USA stepped up today holding a vigil and march this afternoon in honor of 20-year-old Vanessa Guillen, a Fort Hood specialist who military officials say was killed, dismembered, and buried near the Leon River in April, allegedly at the hands of another soldier. The night team's Jaffney Gray with the awareness this group is raising for others like Guillen in the military. You're alone. You're afraid for your life. I was alone. I am Vanessa. I am Vanessa Guillen, a common phrase used among this group of people gathered for a vigil in her honor held at Fort Sam this evening. The FBI says it believes it was 20-year-old Army Specialist Aaron Robinson who struck Guillen multiple times in the head with a hammer before stuffing her inside a box. He, along with the help of a civilian, 22-year-old Cecily Aguilar, then allegedly dismembered Guillen's body with an axe and buried her along the Leon River, following a failed attempt to burn her remains. The way that she was murdered was just brutal. Brutal, disgusting, and vile. Guillen's family's attorney says her death was the result of sexual harassment in the military. However, military officials have not confirmed that. This rape survivor, who goes by the name Regina, says that the entire situation hits close to home. She, too, says she faced devastation while in the military. I tried to report my, crime, my rape, and the ringleader said, you go ahead and report it. There's plenty of tree lines to hide your body. Those gathered tonight say they are heartbroken and disturbed something so tragic happened at a military base. But they add they're not surprised, which is why they are demanding justice. That could be my sister. That could have been my best friend. And I just need to be out here for her to let everyone know that we're, we're out here fighting for her too. They see Guillen's death as a way to bring awareness to unsolved crimes happening to those who serve our country. I think it's important to bring to light situations that a lot of people don't want to talk about. When will there be justice for those who experience this? Unlike Vanessa, I'm alive and it hurts to know that this keeps going on. Japhne Gray, KSAT 12 News. The suspect, Aaron Robinson, fatally shot himself as officers tried to make contact with him. The other suspect, Cecily Aguilar, was taken into custody on account of conspiracy to tamper with evidence. She could face up to 20 years in federal prison if she's convicted. She's expected to appear in federal court in Waco next week.
Also tonight, the Department of Defense has announced the death of a soldier in Afghanistan. 21-year-old specialist Vincent Sebastian Ibarria was from San Antonio. According to a press release, he died during a vehicle rollover accident. That incident is still under investigation tonight. Another vigil also happening today. The family of 22-year-old Jalen Warren came together to remember their loved one after he was fatally shot during a road rage incident earlier this week. That shooting happening near the 4300 block of I-10 on Tuesday. According to San Antonio police, Warren and 25-year-old Sebastian Hernandez were heading, uh, were heading near East Commerce Street and East Houston Street when a person in a maroon Impala opened fire. Hernandez was the driver and was shot in the back while Warren was shot in the back of the head. Hernandez was not seriously injured, but Warren died at the scene. A description of the shooter has not yet been released, but if you have any information about this case, you are asked to contact police. 31 people displaced tonight after a fire at the Palacio del Sol Senior Living Complex near downtown. Firefighters say when they got there, flames were shooting from the fourth floor, as you can see in this video, but they were able to put the fire out quickly. No injuries were reported. Fire investigators say one apartment has significant fire damage and a few others have water damage. The cause right now still unknown. Police say they have two suspects in custody in connection with two robberies. 19-year-old Isaiah Garcia and 17-year-old Valeria Vargas are both charged with aggravated robbery. According to an arrest affidavit, the first robbery incident involved two victims who were forced into their own apartment and then held at gunpoint while Garcia and another suspect allegedly took things. And about a week before that, a couple in a parking lot tending to their baby was allegedly held at gunpoint by the same suspects. Those victims identified Vargas as the getaway driver. There is still a need for dire, dire need for convalescent plasma to help those critically ill COVID-19 patients. Today, a local couple is celebrating their 20th plasma donation. Alicia Barrera visited the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center and has more on what prompted them to begin their donating journey. Deb and John Almarez are celebrating this Independence Day in what they consider to be one of the most patriotic ways helping save the lives of fellow Americans in need. And if it was your mother or your brother or your sister, anybody in your family, you would donate. The couple was diagnosed with COVID-19 back in March after a trip to New Orleans. About five days later after that, we went in to get testing because we felt tired and uh, um, had the chills and classic symptoms. They recovered and then learned how they could help others through convalescent plasma donation. When they get a unit of convalescent plasma, it has neutralizing antibodies in it, and those antibodies help fight the COVID virus. Waltzman explains there's a major backlog due to the lack of donors. Just a month ago, they were only shipping about five to six units of plasma a day, but that's changed. Where we're shipping out 80 to 100 units of convalescent plasma a day to our local hospitals. Together, John and Deb have helped nearly 100 hospitalized patients in San Antonio through their plasma donations. We enjoy doing this together and we feel like um, we want our San Antonio as our family and that's why we're here. According to the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center, all convalescent plasma donations undergo normal testing for infectious diseases. The results are expected to be in by noon Sunday in order for patients to directly receive the transfusion as soon as possible. The USDA requires that donors of convalescent plasma be at least 14 days symptom free, also show proof of their prior COVID-19 diagnosis and meet the same requirements as any other blood donor. For more information and also how to sign up, you can visit ksat.com. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Outside with live cam, just shy of 90 degrees. It is warm out there. Ooh, look, look at that. that. There they nice. are. Having some fun. Yeah, look <laughs> at that. That's a, that's a cool sight there on live cam. Just hope everyone's being careful, following the rules. Got to say that. Hey, so remember during the news at 5, when I told you we had our first 100 degree day of the year today, that was true. The early climate reading was 100 degrees, but guess what? Tim, we did a little bit better than that. 101, the official high temperature today in San Antonio. A little overachiever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 106 in Carrizo Springs, 107 in Del Rio. It is going to be another hot day tomorrow. So um, just a little bit of climatology for you here as far as our first 100 degree days are concerned. For 24 years or 23 years, out of all of our climate data, we didn't hit 100 degrees. The latest we've ever hit 100, September 1st, the earliest 
February 21st, but the average is June 26th, so we got by a little bit later than that this year. I'll be back in just a bit with a look at your Sunday forecast. Thank you, Katie. Still to come on the night beat. Night beat. The pandemic is worsening across the U.S. and the nation is celebrating Independence Day. The latest on the alarming new numbers next. As the country celebrates its birthday, the coronavirus pandemic is worsening. 57,000 new cases reported yesterday, the third record day this week. Yeah, beaches are closed in some states for the holiday weekend, and about 80% of fireworks displays across the nation have been canceled this year. But some Americans did still find ways to celebrate. Here's ABC's Christine Sloan with the details. Some of this year's 4th of July celebrations looked a little bit different amid the coronavirus pandemic. In our nation's capital, President Trump hosting a celebration on the South Lawn of the White House. We will not allow anyone to divide our citizens by race or background. We will not allow them to foment hate, discord, and distrust. Officials enforcing mask wearing, but there was little social distancing. Beaches that would normally be packed for the holiday closed in California, Texas, and Florida. The daily nationwide death toll and the mortality rate have been on the decline, but deaths are rising in 14 states and hospitalizations are up in 27. Florida logging 11,458 cases today alone, a new record high, and just 100 cases fewer than New York logged at its apex in April. In Texas, where cases hit a new record high, the governor issuing a statewide mask mandate. Austin's mayor critical of the governor's hasty reopening plan says people have to adapt and innovate. We have to do restaurants differently. We have to do bars differently. Uh, we have to we have to be more creative and we're probably going to have to do that until there's a vaccine. Arizona also seeing a surge in cases. Many ICUs in the state nearing capacity. We will get to a point where we have to start, you know, looking at those god awful rules about who not to put into the ICU and such. But many Americans did find a way to celebrate. Beaches in New York and New Jersey packed. Hundreds of boaters forming an island on Minnesota's Lake Minnetonka. In Missouri, health officials now concerned after scenes like this in the Lake of the Ozarks. Some cities were treated to a military flyover. Planes from the Air Force and Marine Corps flew from Boston to New York and on to Philadelphia. As professional sports looks for ways to return safely, legendary NASCAR champion Jimmy Johnson pulling out of tomorrow's race in Indianapolis after he and his wife both tested positive for the virus. We're, we're trying to be as healthy as we can, but you know, on the, the home front with our kids, um, you know, we're, we're heartbroken right now to, to see the fear in their eyes. Christine Sloan, ABC News, New York. Definitely a strange 4th of July to be sure, but mm -hmm. topping it all off, there's a full moon out there tonight yes. as well. Yes, beautiful. It is beautiful. So pretty. Yes, it is July's full moon. That's me. That means it's called the Buck Moon. And from what I could tell from the Farmer's Almanac, it's called the Buck Moon because it's generally this time of year that young bucks start to show their antlers. So. And that is, I can tell you that the park I live next to, O.P. Schnabel, they are all out there with their velvety yeah. uh, horns. There you go. The Buck it's Moon, happening. a full moon. It's a show, show stopping really because it's full and it's very bright and you should be able to see it very nicely. We've also got a partial uh, penumbral lunar eclipse happening tonight, which means the moon is going to move through the outer uh, shadow of the Earth. So not as show stopping as a total lunar eclipse, but uh, the full moon certainly something to admire tonight. So be sure to step out and take a peek there. Current conditions at the airport still just shy of 90 degrees. Dew point in the low 60s. We did see our dew points drop off pretty nicely this afternoon for a lot of us and that helped a lot of us to see temperatures spike into the triple digits this afternoon. Still 90 in Uvalde, still 98 degrees in Del Rio, but thankfully Del Rio, your dew point is still low. It's in the 50s there, so in the pleasant range. So while it's warm, it's a drier heat. There you go. Dew point numbers are going to make a rebound overnight. We'll start tomorrow fairly muggy with dew points in the 70s. Satellite and radar, it's been a very quiet day. We did have a few high thin clouds start to move in and you may notice those if you step outside and take a look at that beautiful full, full moon later on this evening, but no rain out there. I do want to point out that these 
radar returns that you're seeing and in around San Antonio, a lot of that are the bats leaving their caves. So that's what you're seeing there. Otherwise, it's been a pretty quiet day across Texas. There were some showers and storms up closer to the Red River earlier this afternoon. So these lines here, what these are, these are the winds in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere, and they are now rotating clockwise around the heat high that has started to move off to the west just a bit. What these winds mean for us over the next couple of days, they're going to try to usher in some very weak upper level disturbances here through north central and eventually south Texas. For us, that really just means some very low in chances of rain, but we could see that kick in as early as tomorrow afternoon. Now this updated future cast model really not showing much, but as a weak little piece of energy drops down, we could see a stray shower or storm developed tomorrow afternoon during the heat of the day. I think primarily up in the hill country, but majority of us tomorrow finish out the weekend without any rain. That's for sure. We get into Monday, a very similar scenario, some upper level energy floating on by. It's going to be hot and humid for the next few days as no big surprise here. So that energy could spark some low end showers and storms, low end coverage wise showers and storms as we get into the early part of next week. But this is certainly nothing to be excited about. In fact, the much better rain making energy that's going to be off to our east from Houston up into uh, East Texas there and over into Louisiana. However, a few lucky yards could pick up maybe a stray downpour over the next couple of days. Most of us though will miss out. I do wish that we had better chances of rain in the forecast because the aquifer needs it. It's only down one tenth of a foot today, but look at our 10 day average. Once this gets below 660, that's when those stage one watering restrictions will go into effect and with really not promising rain chances on the horizon. I'm afraid that that could be coming up shortly. We'll keep you updated there for your Sunday. More sunshine, a few more clouds than what we saw today. High temperatures back in the triple digits. There's that outside chance of an afternoon shower or storm, but I wouldn't hold your breath tomorrow or the next couple of days. We've got a very a dry and hot forecast for you here, and we'll talk more about the dust, a little bit of it lingering this weekend, but it'll really start to clear out next week. Guys, if the moon's trying to steal the fireworks thunder. Yeah, <laughs> the very July forecast there for us, Katie. <laughs> Thank you. All right, the Spurs will get an opportunity to warm up a bit before play resume. That's right. We've already known how what their schedule is going to be like. Yeah. They obviously start on the 31st, but now we're learning to see, or excuse me, we're learning who they're going to be playing before that happens. When we come back, we've got the details on who they're playing and when, plus. NFL training camp roster is looking like they're getting cut down based on what the NFLPA says. Coming up. The Spurs are another day closer to a trip to Orlando. San Antonio will head to the ESPN's Wide World of Sports Complex on July 9th as part of the last group of competing teams to arrive. Now, the goal behind the move to one central hub is obviously to keep the players safe, but there have been a number of concerns raised regarding complex staff members commuting to and from work every day. An added danger is how quickly the virus can spread from team to team if even one player tests positive inside the bubble. With that in mind, a number of players have decided to opt out from the restart, including former Spur, now Wizard, Davis Bertans. But in making their decision to head to Florida, the Spurs believe the reward of a second chance at playing outweighs the risks involved. I think we're all aware of that risk. Um, it obviously it wasn't an easy decision. I know I think everybody individually had to really think about um, the situation, but from what I'm hearing, like the NBA is going above and beyond um, to create the safest possible environment for us um, in this bubble. Possibly it's it's going to be like more safe for us to be in that bubble, like within each other where we get tested very regularly, um, where everything is, is clean at all times and then maybe even being at home. San Antonio's first game back in action will be on July 31st against the Sacramento Kings. But before the season officially gets underway on the 30th, the Spurs will take part in some inter-squad scrimmages. Here's a look at their schedule. They'll play three teams, first the Bucks at 2 p.m. on the 23rd, then the Nets on the 25th, and finally on the 28th, just three days before their first official game, San Antonio will play the Pacers at 3 p.m. Meanwhile, Indiana will be without shooting guard Victor Oladipo when they hit the courts in Florida. Oladipo announced that he has decided to sit out the remainder of this season, saying he can't get his mind quote, to be fully comfortable, close quote. His decision is not COVID-19 related. His primary concern is about the risk of re-injuring his quadriceps tendon. Oladipo is still traveling with the team to Orlando for his physical rehabilitation. Plenty of eyes will be on center Rudy Gobert. The two-time reigning defensive player of the year was the first NBA player to test positive for the coronavirus and was a major reason for the NBA's initial shutdown in mid-March. Over the past couple months, Gobert has seen his fair share of hate and criticism for his actions prior to the pandemic, specifically a scene where he jokingly 
touched reporters microphones two days before testing positive. Since then, he has done his part to help spread COVID-19 awareness, and now he's doing his best to move on mentally. The people around me uh, really know me. They know who I am. Uh, and that's what matters to me. You know, at, at the end of the day, uh, I won't be able to control everyone's perception of me, but I can control my actions. I can control, you know, the things I do for people around me, for the community, the things I do for, for my teammates on the court, of the court, all that stuff I can control. And that's what really matters to me. Gobert and the Jazz will play their very first game in the bubble against the Pelicans on July 30th at 5.30 p.m. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The NFL just keeps on shrinking. The season does. First, the Hall of Fame game was canceled. Then on Wednesday, the NFL announced that the preseason had been cut down from four games down to two. And last night, it was reported by the NFL Players Association as asked the league to cancel the entire preseason schedule. The reason for the decision stems largely from a lack of practice. Offseason workouts were canceled outright by the pan coronavirus pandemic, and teams will need to train to get ready for the season. However, many games this season will end up being... Uh, however long the season ends up being. The NFL is currently considering this latest recommendation. The NFL Players Association also expressed a desire to cut training camp rosters down from 90 to 80, which means there would be 320 fewer spots than in previous years. As part of this proposal, the union wants to steadily increase the number of players in training facilities over time, 20 during the initial conditioning period, then up 40 during non-contact practices until finally full rosters would be at practice during the final two weeks before the season starts. And we, when we come back, the Chonklas are back in action on the 4th of July. Got all the highlights for you, Tim, Courtney. Very I'm a Pena out there. Yes, yeah. <laughs> she oh looks boy. great. Throwing the chocolates. All right, thank Love you. It. During a July 4th weekend event in South Dakota, we'll talk about that when we come back. Welcome back. During a July 4th weekend event in South Dakota, the president was critical of protesters calling for the removal of controversial statues and other symbols. But as the protests have continued in the weeks following the death of George Floyd, one NFL team is considering a name change. Here's ABC's Alex Presha with the details. President Trump kicked off the 4th of July weekend with an event at Mount Rushmore Friday night. Despite cases of COVID-19 increasing around the country, the audience in the amphitheater packed shoulder to shoulder, many not wearing masks. As the president prepared to take the stage, news that campaign senior advisor and top fundraising official Kimberly Guilfoyle tested positive for COVID-19. She's also dating the president's son, Donald Trump Jr. He's tested negative. Following the death of George Floyd on Memorial Day, many people across the country have been calling for police reform and an end to what they consider systemic racism. In Aurora, Colorado, protests continued this weekend seeking justice for Elijah McClain, who died after police detained him. The movement has led to a reconsideration of controversial flags, statues, and symbols. The president pushing back against those protests. This movement is openly attacking the legacies of every person on Mount Rushmore. This monument will never be desecrated. Former Vice President Joe Biden believes the president is dividing the nation. If we don't unite the country, we're in deep, 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 deep trouble. Four more years of Donald Trump will fundamentally all of the character of this nation. But this president gives us no direction and pits us against one another. We can't go on like this as a nation. And now the NFL's Washington Redskins considering a name change. The team saying, in light of recent events around our country and feedback from our community, the team will undergo a thorough review of the team's name. And developing overnight, another storied franchise announced it too will reconsider its name. The Cleveland Indians say that they'll engage the community and stakeholders to determine the best path forward for the team's name. Alex Perche, ABC News, Maryland. President Trump has signed legislation now extending the deadline for businesses to apply for a loan under the Federal Paycheck Protection Program. Hours before it was set to expire on June 30th, Congress passed the bill, sending it to President Trump's desk. PPP was established in March as part of the coronavirus relief bill. Since then, more than 4.8 million small businesses applied for $520 billion in potentially forgivable loans. Officials say there is still $130 million left of PPP loans. The deadline to apply for the program now is August 8th. Google is trying to help its users get around during the coronavirus pandemic. The company has launched a new feature on Google Maps to help people navigate the areas affected by the virus. The feature notifies drivers about checkpoints down the road before they cross borders. They can also get alerts about local health restrictions on their routes. Public transportation riders can get information about mandatory face masks and other requirements, while people who are on their way to a COVID testing site 
will get alerts about whether they are eligible for a test. Mask effectiveness spurring all kinds of conversations nationwide. Some posts circulating online claim since you can smell things like food or smoke through a cloth mask, the covering will not filter the coronavirus. Well, we ran it through our KSAT Trust Index and we'll tell you up front, the claim is false. Right now, there are so many options for masks that protect against COVID-19. It can be overwhelming, especially when you hear people say they don't work at all. There are many claims as to why certain masks don't work. One of them now circulating online says if you can smell odors that come through the mask, the virus can get through too. We ran it through our KSAT Trust Index. Experts say that is false, and the reason has to do with particle size. These are extremely tiny molecules. Although the COVID-19 virus is a microscopic microorganism, it still is much, much more complex than the molecules that would cause odors to be smelled. There's no way that you could prevent an odor from coming into your nose uh, unless uh, you weren't able to breathe. That being said, no mask is proven to keep the virus out 100% of the time. So Dr. Fred Campbell with UT Health San Antonio says how you use the mask is important. Any mask with greater than two layers is gonna reduce the chance of transmitting COVID-19 uh, at least by half. So as for that third layer, a lot of these cotton masks you buy have a pocket inside where you can insert a bunch of different types of filters. One material that Dr. Campbell suggested works the best, you may not have thought of, denim. So maybe time to cut up some old jeans. The public is being asked not to use N95 masks so they could be saved for medical professionals. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Still looking for new things to try at home amid the pandemic? How about a movie under the stars? We checked out some of the best home movie projectors to help find the best for your backyard. That story's next. If you are looking for something to do as you spend more and more time at home, how about a backyard movie night? 12 on your sides, Marilyn Moritz uh, tells you what you need from the best mini projectors all the way to the popcorn. Set up the big screen and break out the popcorn. It's backyard movie night. When it's nice outside, my wife, son, and I can set up the projector, make some popcorn, and then have a fun family movie night. Jim Wilcox is Consumer Reports tech guy. They just tested mini projectors, ranging in price from about $100 to $500. In general, we found you get what you pay for, both in terms of image quality and features. The best one in their test for picture quality was this LG model. It also has some useful features like Bluetooth and wireless mirroring which lets you send video directly to the projector from a smartphone or a tablet. It also has a built-in TV tuner, so you can connect an antenna and get free over-the-air broadcast TV. We did find one bargain in the bunch, the AXA Pico projector. It's a very compact, no-frills model, and it had decent picture quality and better-than-expected sound. Many, many projectors don't have great sound, so you may want to add an external speaker or sound bar. When it comes to setting up your backyard movie night, you'll need an oversized screen. That should work. There are also portables with built-in stands or even blow-up screens, or you can just DIY it. You can also use a light-colored wall or even a plain white sheet like I did. Just pull it tight so there are no wrinkles. Now all you need is the popcorn. Marilyn Moritz, KSET 12 News. I think I said this last night too, but if you're gonna do that, maybe get a fan yeah. out there as well. <laughs> get that air moving around just a bit. It is warm. Mister. <laughs> yeah. Great view of life. Came out a little firework go off there by uh, the Alamo Dome. Beautiful view of the Alamo City tonight. Still sitting at 89 degrees at the airport. You're still in the upper 90s out in Valverde County. 98 in Del Rio right now. 89 in Uvalde. Tonight we'll see temperatures generally fall into the mid to upper 70s with a few clouds around through early tomorrow morning. Winds light out of the south southwest just 5 to 10 miles per hour. It's going to be very hot again tomorrow afternoon, but we've got very low in chances of rain the next few days. We'll talk more about that and get a check of the trough. Topics coming up next. We've seen several people out there shooting off fireworks, probably not in a legal way, but hopefully everyone that's out there is doing it in a yeah. safe way tonight. Socially distance. I know we've been talking so much about the big yeah. groups, but I know I've seen a lot of people on social media being very responsible, just doing it with their family and yeah. friends. Like close. We've enjoyed watching them on, on the live <laughs> cams tonight. <laughs> that is kind of, yes, that's what I love about New Year's Eve and 4th yeah. of July. You get yeah. a good view of it on our live cam, yeah. Uh, I want to give you a quick update on what's going on in the Atlantic Basin. We are in hurricane season, and 
So far, things have been a little quiet. It got off to a pretty busy start there late May, early June. I mean, it's been fairly quiet, largely in part to the Saharan dust that's been coming off of Africa. But we do have two areas of interest here. Uh, one is tropical depression number five near Bermuda. This will continue to move northeast. It could become our next tropical storm uh, as early as tomorrow. We'll keep an eye on that for you. But other than bringing some rain and cloud cover to Bermuda, this is not going to be much of an issue. There is an area of disturbed weather down in the central Gulf of Mexico, north central Gulf of Mexico that the National Hurricane Center is keeping an eye on over the next two to five days. Just a 20% chance that this would develop formally into a tropical cyclone, but a lot of rain here expected to move north and east over Florida and along the east coast. So this area of disturbed weather will not be impacting our weather here in Texas and elsewhere across the Atlantic. Very quiet, especially coming off of Africa through the Atlantic into the Caribbean. And a big reason for that are the large plumes of Saharan dust that have been coming across the Atlantic for the past couple of weeks. At this point, there's another very large plume sitting out in the Atlantic right now. Some more dust into the Caribbean, and we have been dealing with a smaller plume of dust here closer to the state of Texas. So if you notice things looked a little bit hazy yesterday, even a little bit today, there is some of the Saharan dust still lingering in the air, and I can't rule out it looking a little bit hazy, especially if you're driving into town and you can see the downtown skyline as we get into the day tomorrow. This is cycling through really quickly. I thought we put another pause point in there, but I guess not. Long story short here, dust will continue to thin out as we get into next week, and it's really not going to be an issue next week at all. So no worries about being able to get out and exercise, things like that. The issues with air quality, that was all last weekend. We're not going to see those issues as we get into tomorrow and then next week. So little hazy tomorrow, little dash of Saharan dust for you, but overall more sun tomorrow, a few more clouds than what we saw today, but it'll still be plenty hot out there. We're looking at another triple digit day across South Texas tomorrow with some slightly higher humidity down on the coast. That'll keep your air temperatures limited to the upper 90s, but bottom line, another hot day. And with that sunshine, the UV index again tomorrow, just like today will be extreme. And what this means is if you're going to go out by the pool, hang out outside, if you don't put sunscreen on, skin damage could start to occur in less than 10 minutes. So keep the water and the sunscreen handy tomorrow. 84, 10 o'clock in the morning, 101 tomorrow afternoon. There's that very low end chance of a shower or storm tomorrow. That's mainly going to be for the hill country. And here's what we have going on. The heat high has moved off to the west just a touch. That opens the door for some very weak disturbances to filter down through central and south Texas. These very weak disturbances, especially during the middle of the afternoon when it's hottest, could spark some isolated showers and thunderstorms as we get into tomorrow tomorrow in the next couple of days, but rainfall coverage is going to be low and most of us unfortunately will miss out. So next week, not as much dust. That's the good news, but the bad news, not much rain and staying plenty hot guys. Last last year, I remember the dust not bothering me at all this year. Definitely a different story. So I was kind of surprised by that much thicker this year out yeah, there too. Absolutely. Hopefully it'll be moving on. <laughs> all right. The flying chocolates are back in action. Not the regular team that we get to see the missions. Obviously they've canceled the season. So these are collegiate players that are getting a chance to play. That's right. This is part of the Texas Collegiate League. So area players from TCU from UIW, all these kind of colleges, but they're back in action tonight. They started the season 0-2. After tonight, they are 3-2. and We've got all the highlights and how they got it done. Plus, Joy Chestnut, a man amongst men once again. Next. Major League Baseball teams are ramping up for the start of the 60-game 2020 season. That includes last year's World Series runners-up. Houston Astros, who took batting practice at Minnie Maid Park this week. Operations were markedly different. There were plenty of new social distancing guidelines, group rotations, and cleaning protocols. What does pitcher Lance McCullers think about the new setup? The Astros you know, have done an awesome job making sure that guys are staggered and making sure that um, there's a smaller group of guys coming in and no one's really hanging, hanging around with, uh, with wasted time. Everyone that's been here has been really productive. They've gotten in, they've gotten the work done, and then and then they've gotten out. So I can't speak for other organizations, but um, so far with Jeremiah, the staff, and uh, the Astros have put together for us has has been awesome. 
No official schedule has been released for the baseball season yet, but reports indicate the Nationals will face the Yankees in the opener on July 23rd. But New York has other things on their mind right now. Pitcher Masahiro Tanaka went down during batting practice this morning after getting drilled in the head by a comebacker off the bat of Giancarlo Stanton. Tanaka collapsed immediately and remained on the ground for five minutes. He did walk off with some field assistance and was taken to New York Presbyterian Hospital for further evaluation. Team officials say he is alert. Shifting gears now, let's head to the Wolf. Mama Pena and the Flying Chonclas looking for their third straight win tonight against the Cane Cutters. Errors have been the name of the game so far in the TCL, and that's no different tonight. Bottom of the first, base is loaded. Connor Shepard grounds one right back to the pitcher, hesitates on a throw to first, then throws to second, trying to turn a double play, but the throw back to first gets away. Two runs come in to score, and the Chonclas jump out to a 2-0 lead. Head to the bottom of the fourth now. Chonclas up 3-0. Runners on the corners. Porter Brown slaps one into right. Here comes Johnny Hernandez, and that makes it 4 to nothing and they're not done. Next up, Jordan Thompson cranks one deep to left. That's going to ricochet off the wall as another two runs come in. Six runs in the inning. The Chonklas win big tonight, 12-2. to two. To the racetrack now, GMR Grand Prix at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This race has been the bane of Scott Dixon's existence so far. He's been the runner-up here for three straight years. This year, no contest. He takes the lead on the 50th lap and never looks back. Dixon wins by 20 seconds. It's the 48th victory of his career. From many, we are one. We are America. This is Nathan's, and it is the 4th of July. A tradition unlike any other. It's the Nathan's famous hot dog eating contest, and this year it's being held indoors with COVID-19 safety measures in place, like the barriers between contestants, as you can see. But... That didn't stop the greatest hot dog eater of all time, Joey Chestnut. The 12-time champion in this event added a 13th win to his resume by inhaling 75. 75 hot dogs and buns in just 10 minutes. That's a new record, breaking his own mark of 74, set back in 2018. I knew I was fast in the beginning. It was like blistering speed. And uh, the, the dogs were cooked really well today. And... Uh, it, it, it kind of minute like six is where, where I really miss the crowd because they, they, they're pumped up and uh, I, I hit a wall and it took me a, a little bit more work to get through it. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a crazy year and I'm happy I was able to get a record. And if that wasn't amazing enough, Nikki Sido defended her title from last year and also broke the women's record by eating 48 and a half hot dogs and buns. That's three and a half more than the previous record set back in 2013. That's her seventh straight year, so some dominant performances and uh, I don't know about you guys, but I, I think I'm good on food for the rest of the night. <laughs> Joey Chestnut says the dogs were cooked real good this year, <laughs> like he could taste them. <laughs> well, when you inhale them that quickly, I hope they taste good. I Thank wouldn't. You. I wouldn't Thank be you. able to know. I can't watch that video. It's, oh, I know you were. You, I, I saw you. I yeah. actually have to look away, and I just it don't. It's one of the grossest things Americans do. But hey, <laughs> it's America. You can do it. People we'll be love right it. Back. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah.